It's like an American folk legend. Uh, like all folk legends, it comes from legendary folks. Uh, you could probably say that Mark Twain was the first hipster. I wouldn't say that. You could say that. Uh, and you can trace the hipster back to the bohemianism at the turn of the century, uh, trilby, free love, moving from the city, uh, moving into the city, making your fortune. 
the hipster really comes of age in the jazz age, the roaring 20s, the jazz age, prohibition. In fact, it's possible that the first use of the term on hip comes from somebody walking into a speakeasy with a flask in their hip pocket. On hip may have meant I'm carrying, I'm with it. But it really took off in the 30s with jazz musicians like uh, Cab Calloway, Mez Mesro, 40s beboppers, Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker, 50s, of course, the Beats, Kerouac, Ginsburg, 60s, Lenny Bruce, Bob Dylan. There's an arc here, there's a similarity. The hipster in every case is a kind of street philosopher searching for authenticity in an age of technology. And the hipster's got style, his own sense of style, his own way of walking, his own way of talking, and his own sense of humor. In fact, it's mostly about humor for the hipster. A kind of irony, looking in from the outside and laughing, authenticity. Now, it's tough to get that kind of authenticity, that kind of personal style today. And the reason is obvious. It's because of technology. Think of technology as a funnel. You know, hundreds of years ago, before the printing press, it was a fairly straight shot, slow going. Got up in the morning, you tilled the field, you sang your song, you married the girl, you fought for the king, you died of the plague. <laughs> Today, it's infinite. The funnel is infinite. And it's easy to drown in the data that's coming through. Now, data by itself is not information. We know that. Data becomes information when you can use it, when you can use it to tell your own story. Clicks, hits, likes, they can sell the story, but they can't tell the story. The story comes from a person living a life making their own mistakes. Or as the great jazz musician Charlie Parker once said, if you don't live it, it won't come out of your horn. So today we have this illusion of plenty. We have all this data, but it's increasingly difficult to define a personal style. Or as I like to say, it's easy to die of thirst trying to drink out of a fire hose. But there's something definitive about the hipster. For example, if Miles Davis were to order a cheeseburger, by definition, that would be a jazz cheeseburger. <laughs> the hipster defines the space he occupies. How do you get that kind of authenticity? How do you get to the point where you can write your story even as you're living it? As Cannibal Adderley said, and I like to quote these jazz philosophers, as Cannibal Adderley once said, hipness is not a state of mind, it's a fact of life. Style, true personal style. Now you can't teach style, but you can learn style. Today, there are over 500,000 kids in the United States trying to learn jazz in high schools and colleges. Approximately 50 years ago, there were exactly no high schools and colleges teaching jazz, and maybe 5,000 people trying to learn it. So what have we got from this wealth of talent? Well, the first thing we've got is uh, too much technique and not enough style. People, young players, sound like their technique today. They don't sound like their experience because they learn to play in an academic situation as opposed to in the world. Now, ex experience, good judgment, good judgment comes from experience. And experience comes from bad judgment. <laughs> you have to make your mistakes. It's essential, you have to make your mistakes. Because, in fact, and this is particularly true in jazz, what you stumble on is an invariably better than what you're looking for. It's, it's just a truism in jazz. How can we get this kind of style? Well, let me see if I've made any mistakes so far. Yeah. Uh, now, technology has its own agenda. Every technology has an agenda. My favorite example of this is in the Bruce Chapman book. It's called Songlines. In the book Songlines, 
uh, Chapman follows uh, an Australian Aboriginal culture. This particular culture has invented a magic song that is the map of its territory, literally. Everybody in the culture learns the song when they're young, and as they walk through this massive territory in the outback, they sing their song, and the song tells them what they're seeing. It's, it's a mirror image. I see the big red tree in front of me, I see the rock that's shaped like uh, a kangaroo, and over there is the hill. And they walk, and you can't get lost. But then they took a member of this society and put him in a car and drove him at 30 miles an hour through the territory. And the guy was speechless because it was moving too fast. By the time he said, I see the red tree, he was over the hill. Technology can rip you up by the roots. But it doesn't have to be like this. Now, in jazz, we say there are no mistakes, there are only opportunities. Art Blakey, another great jazz philosopher, he said that's how jazz was born. Somebody goofed. <laughs> it's literally true. And he said, and your job as a jazz player <coughs> is to be so professional that you take that perceived mistake and turn it into something beautiful. No mistakes, only opportunities. In a world of increasing technology, the way to develop a personal style is by respecting and paying attention to your mistakes, your perceived mistakes. That's the heart of your style. Or more precisely, how you recover from your perceived mistakes. That's your style. Style is the art of recovery. You fall, turn it into something beautiful. After all, in jazz, what we're trying to do is we're trying to play what we don't know. Miles Davis said this to me. I don't pay you to play what you know. I pay you to play what you don't know. <laughs> How do you know what you don't know, let alone play? Of course, you can't. It's, it's an oxymoron. But the fact is, we still try to do that. That is exactly what we're trying to do in jazz. And so it's called the sound of surprise. How do you do it? You make the mistake into something beautiful. But here's the trick. You have to do it in real time. See, in jazz, the time is always going by. It doesn't stop. Now, if you do something and you didn't intend to do it, you don't get to say, hey, wait a minute, guys. Hold on, hold on, let me think. No, it's going by. In real time. John Coltrane once said, playing with Thelonious Monk felt like stepping into an empty elevator shaft. That's what it felt like playing with Mark. Floor falls away. A jazz musician in that situation is obligated to try to go up rather than down. Now, granted, he's going to fail. A lot of times he's going to fail. But without the possibility of failure, there's no opportunity for success. If you're not ready to fall, you're not ready to fly. Failure is part of success. It's the same thing. And in fact, this risk, this element of risk, making something beautiful out of your mistakes in real time is what gives any life meaning. In the world of literature, it's called character development. So how do you develop style in the age of technology? Embrace your inner history. Respect your mistakes. Write your own story. Listen. Human imperfection is, a, is exactly what makes us perfectly human. Thank you.